Today we are talking about Christian anthropology. Now you need to put your thinking gaps on today because this is really important. We could do eight weeks on this topic. I mean, we could do eight weeks probably on a lot of different topics. But the issue of Christian anthropology is so fundamental and so critically important. What I'm going to try to do today is to spend time talking about what Christian anthropology is and what the issues are related to it. And then I want to spend a little while talking about the why it's important, the critical aspect of our having a, a Christian anthropology as opposed to some other kind, which you'll understand what that means as we go along. Now, if you were in the Old Testament theology last term, we did a class on Christian anthropology from an Old Testament perspective, because the Jewish anthropology is quite different than what the, um, the New Testament or Christian anthropology is. It's not, it's not different in its foundation, but New Testament or Christian anthropology is uh, more refined. I mean, it's, it's completed, whereas it's almost as though the Old Testament anthropology, they had a basic understanding of what we were made as human beings, but they didn't know where we were going. So they had the first part of it, but not the second part. And so we will, you know, we'll work through that. Our schedule. Today we are on Christian anthropology, or being human before God. We're going to talk about what that means. I am going to get into hamartiology and soteriology today. We will spend probably our last hour on that since we're going for three hours today. You remember that, right? We're going to go to the um, Today my intention is only to get into hamartiology, which is the doctrine of sin. And then next week I will complete that topic on soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation, the other half of that sin and salvation kind of formula. Then we will, the following week, we will do eschatology, and then the conclusion and final exam. Okay? Clear about that? Any questions? So today we will focus primarily on Christian anthropology, but I will at the end get into the doctrine of sin or hamartiology. And I'll even tell you what that, how that, we got that word, what that word comes from. Okay? Um, today, Christian anthropology. Christian anthropology seeks to answer the question, what does it mean to be human? Now, there is a secular anthropology as well. Anthropology as a whole is the study of humanity. Um, secular anthropology usually focuses on a comparative study of the various physical and social differences or characteristics of humanity down through time in various places. It is, anthropology is the study of how different cultures developed and all that sort of thing. But particularly, theological anthropology is the study of humanity as it relates to God. Christian anthropology specifically is the New Testament or the Christian theological anthropology, where we are looking at what it means to be human in light of a belief in God, and especially in light of a belief in God that has been redeemed through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. The idea of um, in what way are humans made in the image of God, this is some of the things that we got into last term when we talked about an Old Testament theological anthropology. Um, it, the basis of any theological anthropology is, is Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Now, I, I say that. It's possible to have a Buddhist theological anthropology or a Hindu theological anthropology. We're not going to go there because they have never, those religions have never developed a, um, to the extent an anthropological explanation of humanity to the, in the same way that the Jewish people did in the Old Testament, uh, from the Old Testament, or that Christian anthropology, which is the most developed of all uh, theological anthropologies. Does that make sense? You see where I'm, where I'm going with that? Okay. But Genesis 1, 26 and 27, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, uh, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So theological anthropology says we are somehow made in the image of God. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be a human being if we are told that we are made in the image of God? And how does that affect our understanding of how we're supposed to live our lives? Um, as I say here, only the fact that humanity was made in the image of God and was created for a unique relationship with God, but fell from that relationship by disobedience and betrayal, uh, do we have a reasonable excla explanation for what is wrong with us and what we can now do about it. 
So Christian anthropology is, it starts here, which is the Old Testament uh, basis, but Christian anthropology deals with who we are and how we relate to God, especially given the salvation that is made available in Jesus Christ. Remembering, of course, that Jesus himself became incarnate, became a human being. So the incarnation becomes an important part of our, our Christian anthropology. A key verse in our Christian anthropology would be Psalm 139.14, which says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I am fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. There's a wonderful series of books that uh, Philip Yancey did with Paul Brandt. Um, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made is one of them, We're talking about the nature of the human. Uh, Paul Brandt was a doctor, a medical doctor, who uh, identified the, uh, the cause of uh, Hansen's disease, which Carolyn refers we call leprosy. Um, <laughs> Carolyn's last name is Hansen. <laughs> she has a funny story that when she was when she was in what grade? I don't know, I think ninth grade. Ninth grade or something, the teacher said, you know, we're talking about leprosy, but I prefer you call it Hansen's disease, and Carol said, I prefer you call it leprosy. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, Paul Brandt was the man who discovered the bacillus that was responsible for, um, uh, and I met him, I, he, he died a number of years ago, but, and so therefore led to the cure for leprosy. Uh, a significant guy who wrote the book, Spiritually Wonderfully Made with Philip Yancey. I got off track there, anyway. Um, give you a little bit of background history to the development of Christian anthropology. Um, one of the first Christian uh, thinkers, theologians, who dealt with the issue of theological anthropology was a man named Gregory of Nyssa. Gregory and his brother and another guy were known as the Cappadocian Fathers. They lived in the 4th century. Um, Gregory of Nyssa lived from 335 to 395. He was one of the first to really think through theologically what does it mean to be made in the image of God and to be saved by Jesus Christ who was incarnate as a human being. Um, he, he focused especially on the distinction between being something that is created and something that is uncreated. That being we are created beings, God is an uncreated being, and yet in what way are we created beings similar or in the image of a, an uncreated being who is God? Um, he focused especially, Gregory of Nyssa did in his writing, on the extent to which we have an, uh, an infinite capacity, and even though we are finite creatures, the one aspect of us that could be considered uh, virtually infinite is we have an infinite capacity to grow closer to the divine. Because we were made with a physical body, and we yet have the breath of God in us. There is something that is both finite and infinite in us. We are both physical and spiritual. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about this concept of dust and divinity when we talk about the, the importance or the significance of a Christian anthropology. Um, so Gregory of Nyssa, I'm not going to get into a lot more detail, was the first in the 4th fourth, fourth century to really develop this idea of what does it mean to be a human being in the image of God and yet be a created being. The next person who, who significantly influenced our idea of Christian anthropology and who influenced virtually every other theology that we have is Augustine of Hippo. St. Augustine in the 5th century, um, certainly one of the most significant people in the history of the Christian church, um, he wrote the world's first autobiography. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Augustine's Confessions is the first autobiography ever written. You can read the Confessions today, which is his own, his own explanation of his coming to faith and the struggles that he had. And it's like it was written last year. I mean, it's an extraordinary book. Um, Augustine of Hippo gave Christianity a, 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 an understanding of God being still sovereign and in control after the destruction of Rome um, in the 400s, because that's when uh, Augustine lived. Now, Augustine was the first of the Christian Latin um, writers, that is, the Western writers. He was in North Africa, Hippo, but it was a Latin area at that time. Uh, by the way, when I said that Gregory of Nyssa was one of the three Cappadocian fathers, Cappadocia is a province in sort of um, central Turkey, and it was a, an area where there was a lot of monastic movement, a lot of, uh, a lot of growth in spirituality in the Christian faith, and Gregory was part of that. But Augustine, North Africa, from a major city, spoke Latin, was the first of the, the uh, Latin church fathers, as they're called, to really develop a very clear anthropological vision, and he started out dealing with the relationship 
between the two substances, as he called it, of our humanity. Our soul, which is the immaterial, non-material substance, and the body, which is our material substance. He related quite closely to some of the things that have been written by Aristotle. I quoted Aristotle earlier about having the, you know, the, do you have the intelligence of gods or humans or beasts, right? Um, and one of the things that, that Augustine did, which is, which is particular to him being a Latin early church father, is he focused on the, the essential aspect of the human body in our, in our personhood. Um, part of Greek thought, which sort of influenced the, the Greek early church fathers, even Gregory of Nyssa and some of the Cappadocians and others, was this idea that things that are material, are tend, they believed, were not good. At the best, you know, the Christians, Greek Christians began to change a little bit in that, but the basic Christian, uh, Greek idea, sorry, the Greek philosophical idea was that anything material, anything body-wise, was probably bad. The Gregory of Nyssa was a little more sensitive to that, but his focus still was much more on the soul. Augustine really brought the whole concept of us having bodies as being part of who God made us as, as a major feature. He said, for instance, in no wise are the bodies themselves to be spurned. For these pertain not to ornament or aid, which is applied from without, but to the very nature of man. The very nature of man is made by God. Again, the Greek Christians tended to follow more the Greek philosophy and say, yeah, the body is a vehicle that God gave us, but it's too bad. Whereas Augustine and others in a more Latin or Western view began to see the body as part of God's full plan, and not to be taken lightly, not to be sort of excused, but to be accepted. And they emphasize the fact that Jesus Christ himself became a human being with a physical human body. So who are we to make less of that? Um, Augustine described the relationship between the body and the soul like a marriage. That uh, your body literally is the wife of your soul. That those two become one flesh, if you will, using the expression in the New Testament. That those originally, the intention was, in the creation of Adam and Eve, that the body and the soul would be two parts working in perfect harmony. You know, the relationship would be completely perfect and ideal. Whereas with the fall of humanity, we experience a dramatic conflict, a constant combat between our spiritual side, or our soul, and our physical side, or our body. Uh, Paul reflected that when he said, I know the things I ought to do, but I don't do them. And the things that I know I shouldn't do are exactly the things I do. That's reflecting the internal and external struggle. Right? The spiritual, knowing what should be done, and the body being driven, or the tendency to do the things that you shouldn't. So that relationship was intended to be perfect between our body and soul in the original design, but because of the fall, those two things are now in conflict, as Augustine described it. <clears throat> um, he specifically got into detailing the differences in the body and the soul. The body being obviously the material side that he said is composed of the four elements. Uh, the soul having no spatial dimension. It is a kind of substance, he said, but it, it is not a substance that can be measured in any way. So he got into a lot of detail about this stuff. Um, he didn't. He, he didn't feel a responsibility to explain it to everybody's satisfaction. He ultimately said, well, the difference is kind of a metaphysical uh, uncertainty, but there is a distinction. Both are real. Both are halves of what human beings are. To be a human is a composition or a composite of the soul and the body, but of the two, the soul is superior because it is the part that is still most like God, who is a spirit, remember. So he dealt with this kind of dualism of the body and the soul unified into one. That was the focus of Augustine. Now those two, Gregory of Nyssa and Augustine of Hippo, one from the 4th century, one from the 5th century, still are the foundations for our understanding of Christian anthropology today. Because Augustine influenced um, Aquinas, Augustine influenced Calvin, uh, both of them influenced Luther, so all the way down through time, our understanding of Christian anthropology has been affected by these two great original guys in the 4th and 5th century. All right? um, I want to give you now um, some sense, I want to talk for a minute about how it is and why it is that God made us in His image. And then we're going to come back around and talk about what that means for us. 
First, what was God's intention in creating humanity? If we believe that, uh, that Christian anthropology is a study of what it means to be a human being in light of God, and that the basis of that is that we are making God's image, as we read in Genesis 1, then in what way, uh, well first, what was God's intention in creating us? I think the first reason we are given in Scripture is God created us simply for His pleasure and His glory. God took pleasure in creating, and He especially took pleasure in creating the highest level of His creation, which is us. Genesis 1.31, God saw all that He had made, and it was very good. There was evening, there was morning, the sixth day, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. God took pleasure in creating, in the same way that you may take pleasure in painting, or in sculpting, or in photography, or in creating a garden. That's one of the ways in which we are made in the image of God. God simply took pleasure in creation, and then he received glory and uh, basked in the glory that his creation allowed him. It was not because God needed to. Okay? God was not driven to create. He chose to for his pleasure and glory. Part of what th this says is that it is entirely uh, out of God's desire, not out of, out of any need. God does not have need that God created. Okay? A second reason um, is that God created for fellowship. Genesis 3, 8, 9 said, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Of course, immediately after that is where God becomes aware of the sin. The suggestion here is that God in some, some divine way had chosen, despite being omniscient, God had chosen to respect the privacy of his two chief creations, Adam and Eve, and yet Adam and Eve were there for fellowship with God. Not, again, because God had a need. God wasn't lonely. This is one of the natures of God as Trinity. God is a community within himself. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in relationship with each other. God was not in need of somebody else to be in a relationship with, but he desired it. He wanted it. In the same way that because you've got one friend doesn't mean you might not want a second one. You know, the God desired fellowship, and so therefore he made a creation or a creature that he could relate to. That was different than him, but that he could have fellowship with. And so that's the second reason. And the third reason, we are told, that God created, um, especially that created humanity, uh, is that he did it to care for creation. That we were to be the means by which God would make sure that his creation was cared for. Genesis 1.28 said, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living, cre living creature that moves on the ground. And then Genesis 2, 8, 8 and 15. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So these are three of the reasons Scripture gives us for God creating humanity, making us, and particularly making us in His image, for His pleasure and glory, uh, in order for us to be a creature He can have fellowship with, and for us to care for creation. Again, critically important in our doctrine of God, none of these were because God needed to, but simply because it pleased Him. It was His will to do so. Okay. Any questions about any of that so far? Uh, this is not really a stopping place, but I just want to make sure you remember you can ask questions. Okay, you can't scratch your head or I'll call you. <laughs> I, I know that. You can call yourself. Okay. So, um, in what way are we made in the image of God? This, this tells us God's intention. In what way are we made in God's image? I believe that there are uh, a number of ways that we are in God's image. First, we are self-aware, or sentient, is to use, to use the technical word for it. We are aware of ourselves as an individual being in relationship to the world and in relationship to other beings. So self-awareness is one. Second, to be spiritually aware, meaning we are aware of our own spirit and of spiritual needs that we have and of our relationship with God as spirit. We have moral capacity. We have the ability to know right from wrong. We have the ability to choose the good rather than the evil. So we have moral capacity. As often as I would like to blame our dogs for you know, having chosen the evil, they don't really know good from evil. They know some things get them rewards and some things get them punishment. But beyond that, there's no moral value in that. There's just you know, what, what works best for me. Human beings can decide based upon what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. 
Um, and that moral capacity is unique within the created world for human beings, and that is based upon us in the image of God. We also have volition, meaning we can choose. We have control over our own selves and our own destiny. We are communicative. We have the ability to communicate in, to an infinite degree. And yes, our pets, our animals can communicate, but not in the same way. You know, we're always saying, you know, well, tell me what you want to our dogs, you know. If you just speak up, then we will, you know, well, obviously they're not able to do that. We have to kind of just derive from, you know, grunts and whistles what it is they need. Human beings can communicate in great detail. Human beings are creative. Anytime we make anything creative, if you paint, if you sculpt, if you whistle, if you, you know, whatever it is, that is a reflection of a way in which we are made in the image of a creative God. There is an inherent creative drive and desire in human beings that is because we are made in the image of a God who created. We also are <coughs> rational. We have reason. We are able to uh, consider the evidence before us and make rational judgments about it. Our reason can take us to a level of understanding that just pure input of datum cannot give us. We are able to process it in ways that reflect a rationality that is in the image of God. And we are, depending upon who ask, either trichotomous or dichotomous. Does anyone want to come in on that? <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, uh, what's that? <laughs> no, gra no, no gracias. Um, all right, let me talk about, uh, I want to get into a little bit. I'm going to start with that dichotomous or trichotomous thing. Um, what does that mean? <laughs> We're I'm just about to tell you, Ross. <laughs> Trichotomous means that human beings are made in three parts. Dichotomous means that human beings are made in two parts. You will notice earlier that I mentioned the fact that Augustine, for instance, uh, really focused on the human beings being body and soul, two parts. Augustine is an example of somebody who, who presented a dichotomous view of humanity, that we have body and we have soul. The confusing part is that in Scripture there are several places where it talks about human beings having body, soul, and spirit. Second Thessalonians, is a, there's a passage um, and, which seemed to indicate 2 Thessalonians 5.23 and also Hebrews 4.12 uh, talk about the human being as though we have three parts. Now, I want to talk about both of those things. Um, in terms of... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quote them to you again. It's 1 Thessalonians 5.23 and Hebrews 4.12 are two scriptures that seem to indicate that human beings are trichotomous in three parts. Let me talk about that first, and then we'll come back and talk about the... Uh, well, actually, let me talk about uh, dichotomous first. Uh, that's actually simpler, and then I can go on from there. The question is, uh, how are we made? What are we really? So, do we have two parts or three? Are we dichotomous or trichotomous? The most common traditional Christian view, the one that is reflected by Augustine, and remember I told you that Augustine, along with Gregory of Nyssa, really were the most foundational thinkers and theologians in terms of Christian anthropology, the, the, the most Christians today still maintain, whether they're even conscious of it or not, that human beings are made up of two parts. There is the physical, which is the body or the flesh, and there is the spiritual, which is the soul or spirit, and those two things are used interchangeably, <coughs> soul or spirit. Now, there are a number of different passages in Scripture, uh, in fact, most of them, with the exception of the two I just mentioned, 1 Thessalonians and Hebrews, which seem to use the words soul and spirit as interchangeable. They will sometimes use the word soul. They will sometimes use the word spirit. Uh, there are different Greek and Hebrew words that we use for those, but they're, they're, um, the suggestion is that soul and spirit, I'm going to get into in a minute what, what a soul is and what a spirit is and some of the details in terms of helping you understand that. But the issue is, are there two different elements there or are there one? Well, he, the passage in Hebrew says that, that the word of God is able to divide even the soul from the spirit which doesn't make a whole lot of sense if they're exactly the same thing. Uh, and Thessalonians says we are his body, uh, soul, and spirit, as though those were two different things. So how do we understand that? Um, the trichotomous view is that the word spirit, word soul, are two different things, and those added to the flesh, those three, give us what we are as human beings. I want to talk about that. I should also say that, that in modern times, 
There's also a move in what's called monism in term with regard to the human anthropology, which says that body and soul are just one thing that are manifested in two different ways. That's a very modern idea because it it, it plays into modern science, you know, it, it plays to scientism, the idea, for instance, that neuroscience has identified that the so-called higher functions of the mind are simply chemical processes that occur in the physical part of the brain, in the brain. So they're simply, they're physical processes that get manifested as mind. So modern belief has tended to go in the idea, not, not evangelical Christian belief, but modern philosophy and liberal theology has tended to go in the idea that we're only one thing, we're not two things, that the body and the mind really aren't separate. But where that's going is, or the body and the soul aren't separate, but where that's going is the fact that the soul isn't a real thing uh, as an entity in itself, that it's only a projection of our body, and so that fundamentally changes our conception of what it means to be a human being. Since we are made in the image of God the Father initially before the incarnation, and God the Father is a spirit, if you deny reality to the spirit or the soul, whichever way you perceive that, that, that that's only a chemical process that occurs in the physical body, then you've completely done away with everything that has to do with human beings as a spiritual entity. And we can't accept that. That's contrary to what Scripture says. Okay. So um, let's talk about this a little bit. The, the Hebrews passage that I gave you, Hebrews 4.12 said, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I think to get at this a little bit more, we need to talk about um, what is the relationship between body, soul, and spirit. And first, let's start with what is the human soul? What, does the, what is the soul, and how can we understand that as being different than the spirit? The, body, the, the, the Bible, rather, is not completely clear on the nature of the human soul. As we study what Scripture says, it seems to indicate the soul is the part of the body that's not physical. Duh. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the body, it's something else. It's something that's internal. It is uh, clearly indicated, for instance, in Genesis 35, 18, when they talk about the death of Rachel, Jacob's wife, it says, and her soul was departing. The suggestion is that the soul in Scripture is that part of us that is going to last eternally, that will exist after the physical body experiences death. In that way... We believe it is different from the body and continues after physical death, and that's why we cannot accept monism, this idea that, that anything else other than the physical body is just a chemical manifestation of the body. We believe there's something else there. We believe that the human soul is central to what it means to be a human being. A perception of the soul as a spiritual reality is critical to being a person. C.S. Lewis said, you don't have a soul, you are a soul. In other words, soul is what it means to be a person. He said, you, have a, you are a soul, you have a body. So, you can strip away my body and my soul will still be who Ross Arnold is as a, as a person. A person meaning a, an, an entity, okay? When we talk about like the three persons of the Godhead. That that is who I am as a being, is my soul. Even if my body's taken away. On the other hand, if you take away my soul, my body's nothing but a bunch of a bunch of chemicals okay, hanging together out here, you know, a sack of meat. The soul is the part that is the real me. I am a soul. I have a body. I think that is a very biblical and appropriate way to understand what Scripture says about the soul. Now, uh, Scripture does talk about all of my personhood being a soul. You know, you, 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 they talk about, uh, you know, there were 195 souls went down on that ship or whatever. They don't just mean the spirit. They mean all of them. Yes, well, I think you've defined it. Uh, I, I'm thinking that the soul is like your personality. You said who you are. Mm -hmm. So that lives on. Um, that, yeah. that makes it easier to understand. That's our personhood, exactly. Yes, our In personhood. the same way that you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. are three persons of the Godhead. <laughs> my soul is my person inside this body. Now, both the halves of this are necessary in order for me to be the created being that is in the image of God. Okay, because He gave me a body to contain that spirit while I'm, or that soul, while I am uh, alive. When I die, my body dies, my soul does not. That is the basic Christian doctrine. When we talk about salvation, soteriology, next week, we'll get into that. Okay, now, about the confusion.
confusion, since we're talking about that, I've been describing a dichotomous understanding, basically a soul inside a, inside a physical body. That's two parts, dichotomous. We get into some confusion about the human spirit versus the human soul. Scripture seems, as I said, to use these terms interchangeably in most cases, but there might be a subtle difference in those two, especially because we have Hebrews 4.12. Um, the, we also have passages like Numbers 14.24, which seems to suggest that there is an inner force which animates a person in one direction or another, the, the, the sort of dynamic mover of us, which is not the eternal soul, which is something else. Okay, um, and so I want to I want to tell you what I think. <laughs> this is what Ross thinks. I've been given a kind of a background. All right, I believe we are trichotomous. I believe human beings have three parts. I believe that's one of the ways, and some of you have heard me talk about this. I think that's one of the ways that we are made in the image of God, because God is three parts. He is Father, which is the, the, the dynamic, driving, sort of managerial part. He is Son, the incarnate body, and He is Spirit, which is the, the Holy Spirit. Human beings, I believe, have a, and I'll use the word mind for lack of anything else, which is kind of the dynamic mover. It's the management part. It's the part that moves us forward, that makes decisions, it's our rationality, etc. We have a physical body. We are in. We are incarnate. We have. We are carne. We have meat. Okay, that's what carne means. In in the image of the sun, and we third have a spirit. There is a part of us which is not rational, and it's not physical. The part of us which responds to love and loyalty and honor. The part of us which is emotive, emotional. I mean, I don't know about you, but there have been times when I watch a commercial on TV and find myself tearing up in motion thinking, that's not rational. <laughs> that in no way is reasonable. What is wrong with you, Ross? Okay. Which clearly says to me that there is some aspect that is not the rational, it's not the cognitive. There is spirit there. Now, I think of it as being um, mind, body, and spirit. And in that way, I, or mind, body, and the you could say soul. I think that the soul, reversing those terms a little bit, I believe the soul is the part that is the deepest and the heartfelt. That is the part that is eternal and will continue. It will take with us some of the cognitive capabilities. I'm not going to be an irrational soul when I die, but I think that human beings have three distinct parts. I believe that's one of the ways in which we were made in the image of God. How exactly that lines up with the idea of spirit, soul, and body, I, I, can't, I can't claim to tell you. But it does seem to me that as you observe humanity, we are of three parts. Those three parts line up consistently with what God, the, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are. And I believe that's one of the ways we're made in His image. And so I believe we are trichotomous. I'm not, I can't claim to know exactly how mind and spirit, you know, the two parts besides the physical body, how they line up with the idea of soul and spirit. The majority of the time, soul and spirit are used interchangeably. So I... That is my own sense of it. I believe we are trichotomous, um, but Scripture is not more clear about that. Yes? Do you know of any books where they talk about the difference between the soul and the spirit? Because um, that's been something, honestly, I've always wondered about. Yeah, I don't know of any books. I mean, we, you can look for something that gets into that, and you're going to find books that say exactly the opposite. You're going to find books that are uh, more Augustinian, that will say the soul and the spirit are the same thing, and they'll give you all the verses for that. Then you'll find some books that will say, you know, soul and spirit are two different things. We don't know exactly how they're different, but here's two verses that seem to indicate that. Pretty much I've just given you about as much as there is available on it. And if you, if you get a sense in which I have not been absolutely definitive about soul and spirit difference, it's because Scripture isn't absolutely definitive. It's one of those things I can quote you verses in either direction. Now, fortunately, this... Uh, understanding or lack of understanding in no way affects our real sense of what it means to be a human being because the critical part of that is that we are both physical and we are in some way spirit okay, or soul, whichever word you choose to use at any given moment. There is a physical manifestation, there is a non-physical or non-material manifestation. Those are the two aspects which God has created in us to make us human beings. Carolyn? Well, I think it just kind of indicates the, the power of the, the words about um, separating soul and spirit in Hebrews. It, it's, 
it's like trying to figure out why you do something because you've used your body to do it. You were rational about it. You also had the, I mean, <coughs> motion means it's about motion. <laughs> it's about what's motivated. Yeah. What's motivated you. There, it, it all works together, yeah. and separating those things is pretty difficult. <laughs> yeah. I, my, again, my sense is that there are two different things going on besides the physical body and human beings, and I believe that's consistent with the Trinity. But beyond that, I don't think we can take it any further. Rich. Yeah, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that man is born with a spirit, and when God, when he's born again, then God's spirit comes into man's spirit so that they are mingled and God can talk to us through uh, His Spirit to our spirit. Right. The Spirit resides in us. Don't confuse the Holy Spirit with the human spirit, though. Right. Because we do have a human spirit as well. The Holy Spirit indwells us. Right. We could get into discussions of the heart, because it talks about the heart being, you know, that the Holy Spirit comes in and affects our heart, meaning our, our motivations, the things that drive us, our spiritual sensitivity, all those things. So, yeah, it, it's... A lot of different people have articulated this different ways. Um, it's, it's useful for us to be aware of those different articulations, but fundamentally, we have a physical side, we have a spiritual side. That spiritual side may have two components to it, but we, we're not given clear indication of how you separate those or whether you can. The fact that the Word of God can separate those two doesn't mean that we have an understanding of how that works. Okay, Bob? Well, it's interesting if you think about identical twins because identical twins have the same DNA and the same, I mean, identical bodies, so to speak, but they have different minds. Mm -hmm. And different spirits. I mean, if we believe that the spirit is something that is not just linked to our body. Which sort of takes us into the next point, and that is, let's talk for a minute about how are human souls created? That you never thought about that much, did you? There are really three doctrines. I mentioned two here because only two are really Christian in their orientation. The third one I'll mention in order to just dismiss it is the idea that there is, um, it's basically reincarnation, you know, that souls get, get re reused, you know, that we have reuse, and that there's, a, there's this giant pool of souls and they just sort of allot them whenever they were new babies born. That's not a Christian belief, okay? Uh, Christianity does not agree with the doctrine of uh, with the idea of reincarnation. And I know, I can tell you the stories about children in India who knew everything there was to know about somebody else who lived in a different place at a different time and all that. Still, Scripture says, it is appointed unto man once to die, once to die, and after this the judgment. Which, that verse by itself, not counting any of the other the, the theology we developed from Scripture, that by itself would say the idea that we are born over and over and over again, and that we somehow then can go through another life later as a soul. The, the idea of transmigration of the soul is the expression they use. That's the fancy term for reincarnation. Um, it, we do, that is not a Christian doctrine. That is not something we believe. And even if people say, well, but I know a story. I, I'm sorry, but it's not what we believe. Yes, Darlene. Uh, where does, when it was said, I think you can probably say it, that John the Baptist was Elijah. Well, he means he represented Elijah. He was not the reincarnation of Elijah. John the Baptist, um, the, the promise had been made that Elijah would return. Right. And for all intents and purposes, in other words, from a practical outworking of, of what people experienced, John the Baptist filled the same role that Elijah did. In that regard, you can say he was Elijah. But there's no indication that Jesus really meant he was Elijah reincarnated because actually they asked John the Baptist, are you Elijah? And he said, no. Okay. But he filled the, the role and purpose, the expectation for the return of Elijah, John the Baptist filled perfectly. And in that regard, he was. But then Christ said even after that, when they questioned him about it, they said, well, Elijah has already come. Right. Yeah. And that... Yeah, but I don't think he's not talking about reincarnation. Okay. Again, everything else indicates that that's not, yeah. you know, that doctrine is not available to us. Yes. Uh, I've had that verse you just mentioned. It's appointed for every man to die once. I had a hard time with that one because of like Lazarus. He died twice. Well, he only died. Um, he died and then was not actually resurrected so much as revivified. He was resuscitated, so to speak. People have said, well, but Jesus, you know, Jesus um, was not the only one resurrected. You know, it talks about him being the first fruits 
uh, and all of these things as though that were unique. Well, it was unique. Lazarus came back for a short time longer, however many years, and then died again. You know, the widow of Zarephath, her son was revivified, if you will, but only to die again. To be resurrected in the sense that Jesus was resurrected mean he, means he came back from the dead never to die again. You know, so he experienced death <coughs> once. The others, it's appointed unto, unto humanity once to die, and after this the judgment. We've got three or four very unique cases from Jesus or Paul or Peter, but beyond that, and those were revivifications, you know, where after, after a very short time, people were brought back almost as though, you know, somebody died for three and a half minutes and they brought them back on the table. This was a little longer than that, but not fundamentally different than that. Okay. Well, and it's, it's, that's why it's a miracle. Yeah, I it's mean, exactly. The fact that it's it is appointed unto man once to die, but those were miracles. Yeah, God can countermand it all of those natural laws if he chooses to. I mean, that's what a miracle is. And God can choose to do it. It's not for us to choose to do it. That's why magic and things of that sort are never an option to us. Because we cannot, by our own power, or by some power other than asking God, we cannot set aside natural law, the laws of life and death, and that kind of thing. Okay? So, let's talk about how human souls are created. Again, the, one, the, the third option here is the idea of transmigration of the soul, which is not a Christian doctrine, and has never been doctrine. It has never been accepted by the church. It's been very specifically set aside. The Fifth, Fifth Ecumenical Council specifically said, no, we don't believe in that. Okay? So there are two basic theories. One of them is called uh, Traducianism and the other is Creationism. Where does the human soul come from? Um, the, these two ideas, the Traducianism is the belief that the human soul is created at the point of conception by an aspect of the human of the parent's soul in the same way that the physical body is created by a conjunction of the physical bodies of the parents okay in other words that that soul did not exist previously but that it is a product of the souls or spirits whichever word you choose to use here of the parents coming together in the same way that the body of the conceived infant is a product of the physical bodies of the parents. Now, that idea is, one of the reasons why that idea is theologically sound is because that gives us an explanation for where original sin comes from. If a baby is the product of the physical combination of the parents, if that baby is also, the spirit or soul of that baby is a combination of the spiritual or souls of those parents, then that explains the transmission of original sin as being, you know, present there. And people would say, well, how can parents make a soul? Well, tell you what, how can parents make a baby? <laughs> All right? There's a miracle involved in this no matter how you look at it. So the idea that there is some miraculous process by which the soul is created from the, from, if you will, the spirit materials of the parents in the same way that the, the body of the baby is made from the body, the physical aspects of the parents, this is the doctrine of traducianism. And as I say, it historically has been uh, theologically considered most sound because it explains the, the transmission of original sin. How is it that babies are born with souls that are, uh, that are stained by sin? How do they inherit that plague of original sin? Well, traducianism explains that. Okay? The other doctrine for where souls come from, you know, how does a conceived baby get a soul? is called creationism. Do not confuse this with creationism as in non-evolution. This, this is completely different, even though it uses the same word. This creationism is specific to the existence of the human soul at the point of conception. The idea there is that every time a baby is conceived, that God creates a new soul to embed in that baby. This is the official doctrine of the Catholic Church. This is what fueled a lot of, I mean, either one of these doctrines could, but this is what fueled a lot of the argument many years ago over um, abortion and over you know, various other aspects. The Roman Catholic Church took such a firm stand against abortion and even against um, contraceptives because of the idea that God you know, is creating a new soul each time and implanting it in that baby. Um, there's no clear theological explanation. If God is creating a brand new clean soul and imparting in that baby, then how does original sin come to be present? 
This is one advantage I believe the doctrine of traditionism has over the idea of creationism, <coughs> that God creates a brand new baby soul whenever it's needed. Um, there, there's no real theological explanation in that case. Roberta. Okay, because um, we're human, if uh, creationism is to create a new soul, mm -hmm. um, it's still a, a human being who has inherited uh, from all its ancestors, you know, all the genes and uh, why wouldn't that soul that or that child um, have original sin because right. it's still a human being. Right, well, what you just described, though, is it's still a human being from the point of view, all the stuff it's inherited? Yes. The creationism approach says that the parents or the ancestors are not responsible for producing the soul. Oh. Oh. The soul comes directly from God when, yeah. the, when the physical baby is conceived. God gives it a soul and plants it with a soul. What you just described, you know, why isn't it that if it came from all of its ancestors, it doesn't have original sin? That's traditionism. That's their point, is that that's passed on from, you know, that the soul is also a product of creation that results from the combination of two parents. Okay. So that's the difference in those two, and that's why there are doctrinal differences in it, okay? Now, the, a key point here, which is different from transmigration of the soul or reincarnation, is that whether you take traducianism or creationism as the origin of the soul for a newly conceived baby, both of them agree that the soul does not exist prior to conception. There's not some giant warehouse full of souls that you know, they get sent off on assignment when a new baby is conceived, which is basically the idea behind reincarnation. They're all sitting up there on little clouds. Exactly. They're all sitting up there just waiting to get assigned. All right? That's not the Christian view. So, however, whether you, you take tra traducianism, and I have to say, traducianism makes more sense to me theologically. Mm -hmm. that, that, again, the only argument I've ever heard against it is, well, how can two, two human beings, when they, make, when they join to create a baby, how can they create a soul? Well, how can they create a baby? That's just as much of a miracle to me. And so, that, and it, it does explain how original sin could occur. Uh, so I tend in that direction. But both traditionism and creationism with regard to the, the creation of a human soul uh, agree that those souls are new. Whether they come from the two parents being joined or God delivers you know, the soul when the, when the baby's conceived either way. And that's an important theological point. Um, questions about that? So there are conception? no right. just from conception. From conception. Okay. And again, that, that even though that argument was made during the argument during all the, the you know they don't even talk about it anymore because I think everybody realized it was kind of a silly argument. The idea of well, when is it a, when is it a person? The question of when is it a person could be could be articulated. When does it have a soul? When is it not just tissue? Because the argument on the pro-abortion side was, well, it's just tissue, it's not really a person until it's born. Well, the Christian doctrine has always been that, it, that the soul is received into a baby at the point of, con of conception. That whether it is created by God, as in creationism, or inherited as part of the process from the parents, as in traducianism, the, con the Christian concept has always been that there is a soul from the point of conception. Okay. Questions about that? Yes, Sarah. Where did the ideas first generate from? Like, when did like traditionism? When did that first start, and where does the word come from? I don't have an answer to either one of those two questions. I mean, they started fairly early on. Um, I'd have to look it up. I don't know. I mean, I read I read this stuff, and I know those are doctrines, and I you know I'm restudying this. It didn't occur to me to say, well, you know, when did that start? Um, the the uh, yeah, I don't know. I could make something up, but I probably shouldn't. <laughs> okay. You probably think I make this stuff up all the time. Uh, okay, um, I want to... We've already talked about what the difference is between the soul and the spirit. Um, either way, whichever word you use, and Scripture seems to be willing to uh, flip those back and forth most of the time, with the exception of like two or three verses. Most of the verses that talk about the spirit or the soul use them interchangeably, it appears. And so we, we don't know more than that, to be quite honest about it. So why, I'm going to just ask a question, then we're going to take a break. Um, why is Christian anthropology important? Why do we care about this? 
This is, after Christology, this is, I believe, the most important of the Christian doctrines. That is a clear Christian anthropology. Part of it is because our Christology involves the Incarnation, and the Incarnation has something to do with what it means to be a physical body with a spirit, you know, whether that spirit's ours or not. I think to understand the importance of the question, we first need to say every culture that has ever been discovered has had some sense that there is something wrong with humanity. There has always, in every culture, been this, this, I, this very clear sense that something is broken or something is missing or something is lost in the human spirit, inside us. That's the first thing. A clear Christian, let me back up, a clear Christian anthropology is necessary in order for us to make sense of who and what we are and what is wrong with us. See, until we have a sense of who and what we are, we can't have a sense of what is wrong with us, and we can't fully have a sense of what we're supposed to do about it. Until we have a sense of the existence of sin and evil, of the fall and redemption of the incarnation and the grace that comes to us, until we have a sense of what, some way in which our body and our soul or spirit fit together, then the rest of it doesn't make any sense. This is foundational to our understanding of how it all works. What's wrong with us? What should be done about it from this point on? Okay? Is that clear? Why this is important? I'll give you a quote from Peter Kreeft. Peter Kreeft is a, a Catholic professor of philosophy. He's taught at Boston College and some other places. Has written some wonderful books. Okay? Um, in fact, the second half of our time I'm going to spend, or the next hour of our time, I'm going to spend using a, a piece he wrote called Why a Christian Anthropology Makes a Difference. And I can't do justice to this. I was thinking about using this as a basis for sermons. Uh, it's a talk that he gave to a Christian, a Christian Medical Association meeting, and it's like every sentence in this paper, which, it, it, the way it's written, it clearly he was just speaking when he did this, and then they, they transcribed it. And I could preach sermons on this one document for the next 10 years. It is so good. Anyway, Kreef says this in this document, it is impossible to agree, to agree on ethics, that is, on how to act, on what is good and not, if you disagree about metaphysics and anthropology. Metaphysics is what is reality. Anthropology is what does it mean to be a human being in light of metaphysics. You can't know what is good for man until, I'm sorry, and since ethics is unavoidable, we have to make decisions about right and wrong. We don't have a choice about that. Since ethics is unavoidable, so is anthropology. You can't know what is good for man until you know what man is. And on that note, we're going to take a break. Darrell asked me a question at the break that I wanted to address. Uh, and that is that if, if our spirit or soul, let's use those words interchangeably for right now, if our spirit is in us, if the Holy Spirit comes into us, does it replace our human spirit? No. Uh, if we're full of the Holy Spirit, does that mean that our spirit isn't there anymore? And the answer is no. Yeah. Uh, our spirit is the thing that makes us human. It's, the, it's our personhood. It is the part of me that makes me me, as distinct from some other uh, person. And what happens when the Holy Spirit comes in, an analogy to try to understand it, for, for most people in the world, it's as though I'm driving my own car, my car being me. Okay? And the Holy Spirit is nowhere to be seen. But then I might, at some point, if I become a Christian, uh, the Holy Spirit, I might allow them in enough to be in the back seat. Or as I grow in maturity, the Holy Spirit might be more evident by being like in the front seat next to me. But I'm still driving. Ultimately, if I truly give in to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, I may say to the Holy Spirit, He can drive. He can direct my life. But I'm still in the car. I, I don't get out because if I got out, then it wouldn't be me anymore. Okay? My spirit still exists. The question about being filled with the Holy Spirit is to what extent am I allowing the Spirit to direct and influence and control my life according to God's will. But my spirit always has to be there, or it's not me anymore. Okay? Does that make, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the issue of being filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean filled with the Holy Spirit to the extent that my spirit isn't there anymore, or I wouldn't be who I am. I wouldn't be who God made me. Okay? Marvin? I'm going off track with angels and demons, and I think in particular with you know, King Saul, when God sent an evil spirit that would come upon him from time to time, and he right. tried to kill David, and others who had Spirit demons that were cast out, and they're still there, yep. but the other one will take over sometimes. Yeah, some other spirit can come into us and influence us to a greater or lesser degree, but our spirit is still still remains. We are still who we are. 
even though we may be allowing other spirits to have influence on us. Okay, Jane? I'm just reminded of a title of a book that we had in church from there. So if God is your co pilot, change seats. Right? <laughs> if God is your co pilot, change seats. Right? So, <laughs> good. All right, let's talk a little bit about the importance of Christian anthropology. I quoted um, Peter Kreeft here. And I really want to recommend to you, and I'll probably shoot myself in the foot because I'm going to sound, if I do this right, I'm going to sound really intelligent when in fact these are Peter Kreef's ideas because his paper is so good. And it's called, Why a Christian Anthropology Makes a Difference. I recommend you go online and look this up. Peter Kreef, K-R-E-E-F-T, Why a Christian Anthropology Makes a Difference. It really is brilliant. I can't say enough. Um, the point that that Kreef makes, which we quote here, is that it's impossible to agree on anything in terms of how we are to live our lives, on ethics, how to act, uh, on even what is good and what is not good, unless we have a clear anthropology, and then that anthropology is based upon a clear metaphysics, particularly unless we have a Christian anthropology. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, as Kreef makes clear in his paper, everyone, everyone has some kind a philosophical anthropology, and they need one. In other words, everybody has some sort of understanding of what it means for them to be a person and what it means you know, for them to interact with other people. If they didn't have some sense of that, then they probably would, you know, wouldn't be alive anymore. They'd stay in bed all day long and probably starve to death. So they have to have some sense of that. Whether or not we have a right that is a Christian anthropology or not is critical. Um, we really have to, to, to see most of the really horrible things, and here I'm going to interject some of my own stuff. Most of, most of the really horrible things that have happened historically uh, down through time has been because of a really wrong anthropology. And I'll give you some specific examples. Charles Darwin, uh, I'm going to mention several people here. Darwin, Freud, Karl Marx are three of the people who have been most influential to modern society. <laughs> All three of them were accurate in some of their perceptions and completely wrong, in horrendous ways wrong, about the conclusions they made from their observations. Charles Darwin, as a naturalist, for instance, to begin, he um, was correct in seeing that there is some kind of evolution that happened in the world, microevolution. Uh, he was accurate in identifying that there are similarities between how we as physical beings are made compared to other primates. Those observations were accurate, and we cannot fault those observations. But the conclusion he drew from that is that we human beings are simply elevated animals. We are simply primates with attitude. <laughs> and as such, the moral values didn't make any sense anymore, the idea that we were spiritual creatures, that there was a spiritual side, that we had you know, an obligation to the divine, none of that fit into the idea that we really were nothing, nothing more than, as I say, primates with attitudes, that we simply were uh, uppity apes. Darwin was accurate in some of his observations, no question. He was brilliant as a naturalist. He was completely wrong in his anthropology. And as a result, the value of human beings has suffered horrendously. From Darwin, very soon after Darwin, developed what's called social Darwinism. Do you know that term? It meant, if I'm just an animal and you're just an animal, then like the rest of the animals in the world, if I'm strong enough to defeat you and even destroy you to my own benefit, then I have not only a right, but to some sense an obligation to do so. Social Darwinism became survival of the fittest applied to the human race. Social Darwinism became the justification for Nazism. Social Darwinism became the justification for uh, the, the earliest versions of um, efforts to try to select certain people to, to keep and certain people to get rid of. The, the idea that the Nazis, I just lost the word, starts with the Carolyn. Eugenics? Eugenics. Sorry, just drew a white there. I had a brain freeze. Eugenics was the movement at the end of the 19th century and start of the 20th century, which said that since we're just animals, we have an obligation to try to breed humans the way we breed animals, and that is to breed for good things and to breed out bad things. Ultimately, it led to the Nazis' efforts to try to have all people who suffered severe disabilities to either be sterilized or actually destroyed. 
it became the philosophical justification because they believed that the Jewish people and gypsies and homosexuals and a lot of other different groups of people, but especially Jews, to be less than human. And so it gave them social Darwinism, the outcropping of Darwin's idea that we're only really animals, became the justification for the Holocaust. That's what happens when your anthropology is wrong. <coughs> Fundamentally, horrendously, grotesquely wrong. That grew out of the mistake in anthropology that Charles Darwin made. You then get, second example would be Karl Marx. Karl Marx looked at the injustice that ha was happening in the economics in the world, and he developed the theory of dialectical materialism, which basically, in its simplest form, says that human beings are uh, units of production that contribute to the economic welfare of society. That basically, the whole thing about who we are is we are, you know, as human beings, <clears throat> he took away also the spiritual side and said we are what we do. And so therefore, the thing we have to do to try to create equity and to, to, to make it fair is to control the, the aspects of production. That's where communism came in. Dialectical materialism is the philosophical foundation for communism. Well, if you perceive as people as, of people as being nothing more than units of production that exist for the corporate good, then the, the value of an individual no longer exists, other than the, the extent to which they can contribute to the economic welfare of the larger body. Which is why, I mean, um, Adolf Hitler, following social Darwinism as its original basis, ended up annihilating somewhere around between 6 and 12 million people, we don't know, 6 million Jews, as many as 12 million people. Well, Joseph Stalin, people, when you say, who's the greatest mass murderer in the world? People say Hitler. Not by a long shot. Stalin killed somewhere in the neighborhood of 26 million people. How could he do that and sleep at night? Because they were only units of production. And if he felt like that for the sake of economic benefit for the larger Soviet Union, that those people needed to die, for instance, many of them died in the Ukraine because there was a huge famine, and Stalin didn't care because that was not critical to his plans for the economic benefit of the Soviet Union. Because the anthropology that Marx maintained or presented, that human beings were nothing really more than units of production, we ended up with Stalin and 26 million people dying under Stalin because the anthropology was wrong. You then get uh, Sigmund Freud. Freud looked at humanity and he said, okay, the emphasis shouldn't be on the human soul, which Freud doubted existed, nor should it even be, you might be surprised at this, Freud did not think the body was the point, but rather the human psyche, that is the subconscious mind, that the subconscious mind is the primary thing that makes us human, that's his anthropology, and the primary drive and focus and development of the psyche is sexual. To him, sexuality was less a physical thing than it was a psychical thing. Okay? It had to do with the psyche, it had to do, and it, this is all related to Nietzsche's idea of will to power. Well, Freud said that our sexual drive is our will to power, it is the core element of the development of our psyche. As the result of Freud's sexual orientation about the human psyche, that definition of what it means to be human, the sexual revolution happened. And as a result of the sexual revolution, not only did we devalue human beings and begin to objectivize human beings, especially women, but that led to, quite directly, to the holocaust of abortion. The millions and millions and millions of, infant, of, of unborn babies that had been killed are a direct result of the sexual revolution, which is a direct result of the completely screwed up anthropology of Sigmund Freud. All three of these men, Darwin, Marx, and Freud, were accurate in some of their observations, but completely wrong in the anthropology they developed because of it, and you see the results. Having the wrong anthropology leads you in completely the wrong direction. Today we have the influences of things like scientism, which reduces all of truth to the findings of empirical science. Once again, we are just you know, physical entities and nothing more than that. You take away the spiritual aspect of humanity because of scientism, not believing that there is any such thing as spirit. We devalue human beings, and humans therefore, it doesn't really matter 
if we survive or not. Um, and even most recently, our consumer-oriented world, where the advertising industry has convinced us that all we have to do is purchase stuff and be happy. And we have wrecked ourselves on the rocks of a materialistic orientation to our culture. We no longer value the spiritual. We no longer value the, 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 the things, love and family, and the things that used to be valued to us. We're just concerned about getting the latest iPod. That's the only thing that drives many people these days. All of those things, I believe, go back to a fundamentally flawed anthropology. Most of the major disasters in humanity's history, I believe, injustice, and, uh, have been because we didn't understand what it meant to be human in a godly sense. Is that clear? Does anybody get a question about any of that? It's fabulous. So, one of the things that we run into, I mentioned scientism. We today have a danger that we begin to think of science as being the answer to all of our questions. Science and technology. Um, there is a fundamental difference in science and philosophy religion. Philosophy religion I'm using in one sense there. That is the belief in things of the spirit or of the mind. Um, Science believes that if we can refine or amplify our factual knowledge, that that will bring us closer to what life is really supposed to be all about. That it will bring us closer to wisdom or understanding. Well, believing that having better science will lead us to greater wisdom, a better life, a better understanding of what it means to be human, would be like believing that special effects in a movie will make, us, uh, will make the movie better if the plot is terrible, and if the theme doesn't work, and if the characters aren't believable. Life is not going to be made better by having better special effects. And yet science is just the special effects of life. It's not really the core values. Religion and philosophy deal with the core values, and ultimately the core values of what it means to be human. Science is content with dealing with the immediate proximate causes, the things that are on the surface, the proximate explanations or causes, Philosophy and religion seek ultimate explanation of causes, the serious part of what it means. For instance, science can tell you whether or not you can clone a human being. It can't tell you whether you should or not, which is the much more important question. Religion deals with the issue of whether you should do something, whether it's good or not. Science has no morality. And so therefore cannot take us to the most important parts about what it means to be human, about an anthropology that works any more than Freud did or Marx did or Darwin did. Science can observe things, but it can't make the right decisions about what is good, what is right, what is true. Philosophy and religion take very different methods. We don't just use reason, we use faith. Now, our, our Christian faith is not against reason. Nothing that is true is against reason. Reason was given to us by God. But we understand that reason can only address part of the questions. And in fact, there are larger questions which must be dealt with as philosophical and even religious questions. And only those can take us to an appropriate theological anthropology or Christian anthropology. Only, only those more serious beyond rationality not counter rationality, but beyond rationality approaches can take us to answering the question appropriately, what is, what is man? And forgive me for what sounds like sexist, but I'm talking in the universal expression there when I say man, men and women equally, all right? Now, um, there are a number of fundamental questions which I think Christian anthropology leads us to. Um, Christianity is not a, a man-made rational philosophy. It is God-made. It is a God-revealed religion. Our understanding of what it means to be human is based upon what God has shown us, what God has told us. If that's not true, then we are in danger of going off in all sorts of wrong directions in terms of what is real in the world. For example, I mean, similar to the examples I gave you, if you look at some Eastern religions or New Age religions or whatever, um, the, the, the view that they have of the spiritual world is so skewed, it ends up giving us a completely wrong idea of what the spirit is. On the other hand, if you deal with an entirely materialistic world, the scientific world, if I say that 
as a sign is a person given to scientism. Scientism means science is the only way for us to gain truth. Science is the only source of truth. In the same way that Islamism is not the same as Islam, Islamism are those people who are radical in their beliefs that Islam is the only way to believe. They are the ones who do terrorist acts. Scientism says that only science, only rationality, only the principles of observation and experimentation can tell you anything that is real. Well, if that's true, then that would mean that souls and spirits and God and heavens are unreal. <clears throat> and if you believe that none of those things exist, none of those things are real, then you end up with a very different anthropology than if you think that those things are real. If you believe that spirit is only myth, and the only real goods are material goods, then the only virtues exist in enhancing our material existence, our physical pleasures. There are no non-physical benefits anymore, and our anthropology ends up being all wrong. <coughs> you see that? What, where we come from as in terms of our focus of beliefs, a revealed religion by God, or what we think we can figure out with our own scientific processes and our own rationalism, etc., take us to a very different place. We believe that uh, Christianity is given to us by God as a revelation, that Christianity does not contradict reason, but um, the central claims of Christianity are not provable by reason alone. What do I mean by the central claims? The claims that God is the creator God who exists as a trinity, that God loves us, that we are fallen from the relationship of love with God, but that God sent his son to die and save us from our sin, that God in Christ was incarnate as both fully God and fully human. Because of his atoning sacrifice, we are free from the burden of our sins and that we will rise from the dead just as he did to live with him forever. Those are the basic premises and tenets of the Christian faith. None of which are provable or demonstrable by science or rationality alone. It takes more than that. And if we don't accept any of those things, then again, our Christian anthropology is dictated in a particular direction where only material matters, and we end up going in the direction that we went after Darwin and after Marx and after Freud, etc. Okay. Questions about any of that? It's heavy stuff. I told you to put your thinking hats on when we started. Okay. This is excellent. Okay. This is absolutely excellent. This has to do, this is very practical stuff. This has to do with how we live based upon what we believe. Now, the fundamental reason that we believe in a Christian anthropology, that we need a Christian anthropology, is because it's true. We believe it's true. I mean, that more than the pragmatic part of it. I mean, this it, it works. That's, that's a huge advantage. But the fact is that it's true. It's true. If we as Christians are going to be wiser than we are, <laughs> that it's because we understand and accept that there are extremely important truths and values that we cannot know apart from God's revelation and that directly relate to how we understand what we are as people, as human beings, and other, others are as human beings. If, for instance, that we say there is no God, no heaven, no soul, no absolute moral law, if earthly pleasure is the highest end, then, for instance, suicide and euthanasia appear, uh, euthanasia appear to be quite logical options. This is where Nazi Germany went. That eugenics, deciding who lives and dies and who breeds with other people in order to try to produce a better human being, was a perfectly logical conclusion once they had accepted the idea that we really are just animals. Because their anthropology was wrong. Fundamentally, we believe that the truth of my life is that my life isn't just my life. My life belongs to God. It is not just mine. Because after all, if God is not my God, then who is my God? I am. The simplest definition for what it means to be a believer in God is, God is God, I am not. Okay? God is not me, I am not God. God and I are different. He made me. He's in charge. I start with that premise, which is not a rationalistic premise, it's not a scientistic premise, it is a premise based upon faith, but one that I believe proves out. 
Again, if matter, if the physical world is a dream, let's turn this around. I said there is no God, there's no heaven, no soul. Then it takes us in the direction where euthanasia and suicide are legitimate, where human beings are not valued anymore. That affects our anthropology. Turn that around to the other side and say, well, if the physical world is just a dream, if matter is just a dream, and all there is is the spirits of, you know, demons and demigods and, you know, demiurges and all that, as the Hindus and the Buddhists would proclaim, then it logically follows that there is no reason for compassion or charity to the suffering or dying. There are no moral obligations to other human beings because this isn't real anyway. Before I go and do something to try to save a derelict who's starving to death on the street, I would stop if I were Hindu or Buddhist and say, well, he may be working out his own karma and it's not for me to interfere if I believe the physical world is not actually real. So those two examples, if I believe the spiritual world isn't real, it takes me in a direction where what happens, you know, the, the, the spiritual aspects of humanity don't matter. If I believe that the material world isn't real, then I'm led to a place where I say that nothing I do in the material world matters anyway. And all of these lead to a very screwed up idea of what human beings are and what responsibility I have for them. Ideas like the intrinsic dignity of all people, the idea of an inherent and inalienable rights. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal. Those make no sense at all unless we have a balanced view of the, of the material world being real, of the spiritual world being real, and all of those being revealed to us as part of the, are being created by God. None of the systems that we take for granted in the Western culture fit together unless we hold to those basic beliefs, okay? Um, I want to now give you four distinctive Christian revelations that have to do with our anthropology. Um, actually, in his, the article that I've recommended to you by Peter Creep, he gets 16. He starts with four basic, and, and he deals with four, four aspects of, of reality, um, with ethical reality, um, well, metaphysical reality, ethical reality, anthropological realities, and um, epistemological realities. In other words, metaphysical is what is real. Anthropological is what is a human. Ethical is what is right action. Epistemological is how do you know. Epistemology has been a, a major focus of my back past study in philosophical theology, well, philosophy and philosophical theology. Epistemology is the study of how do you know things. How do you know? Is it by perception? Is it by reason? Is it by inherent a priori? Is it whatever? I once told a friend of mine that the special area of my focus was epistemology, and she said, I think my mom had one of those. <laughs> <laughs> a very funny friend of ours. Uh, so. uh, all right, but I want to give you just the last four. Uh, Kreef, in his article, he, he gives you four basic truths that all people maintain, four basic truths that all religious people maintain, four basic truths that Christianity maintains, and then because he's a Catholic, four basic truths that Catholicism maintains. Now, interestingly enough, three or four, I think, that he presents, and he says this, you know, he's, he teaches um, to Protestants as well, and he says that a lot of Protestants would agree with the things I'm saying are Catholic, but they are particularly Catholic doctrine. And one of them has to do with the authority of the church, which is the one we would not agree with as being you know, divinely ordained and equal to Scripture. But uh, anyway, I want to give you four of the basic truths that are Christian revelation that lead us to our Christian anthropology and why it's important. First, there is the metaphysical truth that man is created is a created being, and that we are created in God's image, things we've already talked about. The idea that our origin, where we came from, how we were made, determines our nature and our destiny. Now, those three things are critical to our anthropology. Our origin, where did we come from, our nature, being in the image of God, and our destiny, that we are redeemed. Those three things if we hold the, the Christian view that we are made by God, we are made in the image of God and are like Him in spiritual ways, and that our destiny is to be reunited him in, with Him in relationship because of Jesus Christ, that completely changes our understanding of who we are and of who everybody else is. As C.S. Lewis once said, 
There is no such thing as a mere mortal. Every person that you will ever meet is eternal. Right? Every person you have ever met is an eternal being. No thing you have ever owned is going to last. If we really took that in and really understood what that meant, would that not change the way we acted both toward things and toward people? That is a core issue of our anthropology. Do we really understand that all human beings, our anthropological doctrine is that all human beings are eternal beings, made by God, made in the image of God, and, de and destined for eternity. Our origin, our nature, our destiny. Where we come from, what we are, and where we are going. If we only came from dust or random chance, or the apes, then we are only dust, we are only random chance, we are only apes. And therefore our destiny is only dust or chance or apes, and we should be treated appropriately. But we're not. We are made by God, in His image, destined for relationship with Him forever and ever in eternity. That's where we came from who we are, where we're going. That's the Christian anthropology. That's the metaphysics of it, if you will. That's what people are. That's the reality that we deal with. Now the second truth that I would offer you with regard to the importance of Christian anthropology is an anthropological truth about the nature of humanity, and that is that we are fallen. Original sin. We're going to talk about sin here in a little while. We are fallen creatures. And yet we are also redeemed if we will accept the redemption. According to Christianity, we are both worse than we think we are, and we are better than we think we are. We literally are dust, and yet we are divinity. We are of the earth, and we are of God himself. Again, quoting C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis said, We are amphibians, like frogs are amphibians that live in water and on land. We are amphibians because we are spiritual creatures in the image of God that live in a physical shell. We are both physical and we are spiritual. We are dust and divinity. And in that, we are worse than we could have imagined and we are better than we could imagine. To uh, be too optimistic or too pessimistic in our anthropology, our view of ourselves and other people, um, is, to, is to be contrary to the paradox that we are both. You know, we are divine, and we are of the dust, those two things together. And because of that, because that is our anthropology, to understand us as being made in God's image, but fallen and yet redeemed, should give us an ability to be more realistic about what to expect out of people in the world. Everyone is better than you think, and they are worse than you think. That is why... The very best person ever is likely to do horrendous sins. And the very worst person ever is likely to be capable of kindnesses. Adolf Hitler apparently loved dogs and was hugely generous toward his dogs. He was known by everybody that knew him that he, you know, he was a dog lover. Okay? <laughs> Well, good on you, Adolf. <laughs> and yet, that was the good side of a, of a man who was given over to darkness. So, we should be realistic that great sinners can become great saints, and great saints can, can create great sins, because we are the best and we are the worst, like, like the start of Tale of Two Cities, you know. Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens starts by, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Well, we can say about ourselves, we were the best of creatures, we were the worst of creatures. That's the nature of being fallen and yet redeemed. Okay. The third truth I would offer you is a, an ethical truth having to do with good. The ethical truth is about man's ultimate good, <coughs> our destiny, our supreme good. Um, our destiny is not to become good men or good women, but to become children of God. If we recognize that we are called to become children of God then that should fundamentally change the way we understand our life. We are to become like Jesus. We are become, you know, we are organs in the body of Christ on earth. And therefore, we 
literally, I mean, we talk about the imitation of Christ was the great, you know, the great spiritual work. We talk about becoming more like Jesus. Well, ultimately, we are not supposed to be become more like Jesus. We literally become part of Jesus. We are part of the body of Christ. We talk about the spirit and the body. Well, we are part of the body that is Christ's manifestation here on earth. Um, and we need to recognize the glory of that and how that reflects on our ethical conduct in the world. Uh, it's been, been said that God is easy to please, but he's very hard to satisfy. What that means is that we are what we are now, and yet ultimately we are designed to become divine in the extent, not, not that we're going to be competitive competitors to God, but to become part of the body of Christ. And the more we go to grow toward the final consummation, the more we should be growing in that, until ultimately we are completely united as, as the bridegroom outfitted for the bride in the union in heaven. And that will be the great glory that we exist. Again, Lewis said it well when he said, all people are eternal, designed for eternity, either eternal holiness or eternal horror. There are no ordinary people. You have never met a mere mortal. We are designed to be the bride of Christ, um, a glorious thing. So even though we will all die, unless the Lord returns before we do, we are not meant for death. We are meant for eternity. We are designed for eternity. We are destined for eternity. And the difference in our destiny makes a difference in our value. That's the anthropological part of this. If, if, any, if you believe that people die and then they're dust and you bury them in the ground and the worms eat them and that's it, or if you believe that people when they die that their spirit is eternal will be resurrected to become one with Christ if they're a follower of his, that we will become united with Christ in heaven as his bridegroom, if you believe that, will that not change the way you think of human beings and how you treat them? That's the way this is an ethical difference. Um, Kreeft says in his article the, that unless you're a vegetarian or a cannibal, then you eat animals, but you don't eat people. Okay? Why? Why is it okay for us to eat animals and not eat people? Is it not because we believe there is something fundamentally different in terms of the, the nature and des ultimate destiny of people? I mean, I believe our dogs are going to be in heaven, but it's not because they have a spirit. It's because we love them. Okay? Not because they, they are redeemed by Christ, but because, and, and C.S. Lewis, I'm quoting him a lot, C.S. Lewis says that, that we, we imbue our pets, those that we love, with grace by our very love for them, that they will be with us in heaven. The idea of a new heaven and a new earth would be kind of silly to have a new earth if there were no animals there. So, yeah. I go off on these little rabbit trails. We're going to have five dogs then. Huh? Oh yeah, there's going to be a pack. Um, <laughs> Any questions about any of that? That's a that's a, a mouthful. Yes, Eric. I just had a question about what was the title of that? The other one was Fallen Metaphysical, and this one was. I'm sorry. What was that? What was the title for this one? The last one was Fallen. Ethical. Uh, ethical. Right. And please do go back and read this article by Creed. Honestly, if you, if you take the time and read it, every almost every sentence you go. Uh. And the sense that I get that he was just standing up there talking, because you can see he makes some sort of side comments and jokes and stuff, because he's a very funny guy also. Um, it's quite extraordinary. Yes? The article is titled what again? It's called the... Why a Christian, why a Christian yeah. anthropology yeah. makes a difference. Yes. <laughs> why a Christian anthropology <laughs> makes a difference. Did you do number four here? No. That, that was the uh, ethical. I think that was four, wasn't it? No, yeah. ethical was three. three. Did I skip something? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, got, I only this got this metaphysical truths, and then the second one I didn't hear what it was. Oh, I, missed, I skipped the epistemological truth. Uh, the, the, the third one was uh, ethical. The fourth one is epistemological. Um, the secret of wisdom, uh, epistemology, again, is the uh, theology or the philosophy. Uh, you know, I think in theology because of philosophical theology. But it's the philosophy of how do we know. The idea is that we know because God has revealed, and what he has revealed is in love. That love is the nature of God. Love is the ultimate reality of God. That love isn't just something we experience. Love goes all the way to the top. You know, that God is love. And that God has revealed to us 
by love, you know, through by loving us, by expressing his love to us in Jesus Christ, and we are able to understand God, God because he has loved us. He has given us the ability. The idea of God accommodating himself to us because he loves us. God is not like us. God is wholly other than us. And yet God has communicated to us. He has made us aware of who he is. He has bent, literally bent down to us to make us aware of him. That's how we have the understanding, the epistemology of God. Because he has loved us that much. Pascal said the heart has reasons that the reason does not know. God has touched our heart. His Holy Spirit fills us so that we can know the things of God. This is the epistemological part. This is the great truth of that. Sorry, I skipped that. All right. Any other questions about that? Yes? Just like Roberta, what is the, what is the title for number two? Okay, the first one um, was metaphysical. Phys physical. The second one was anthropological. The third one was ethical. And the fourth one is epistemological. So metaphysics, what is, what is real? Second, anthropology, what is the nature of humanity? Third, ethical, how do we act? What is good and what is not? And fourth, epistemology or epistemological, how do we know? Because God is revealed and he has bent down, he's accommodated to us in order for us to know. Both in the presence, and, and particularly in the presence of Jesus Christ as a human being, the incarnation is the ultimate accommodation, and in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts.